got an expectation, right? So we're going to revisit some of the tools we talked about in chapter 10. Then we'll move on and talk about uh, the different types of risks that we face. And we'll come back to the discussion of systematic versus unsystematic risk and how the risks that we face uh, are different. And there's actually, you know, about unsystematic risk and diversification. So not much we can do about systematic risk. And that will lead us to what we call the systematic risk principle. That will be the first discussion of capital pricing model, uh, model, which is embodied by the security market line. And then ultimately we'll kind of discuss this risk return trade-off. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, but as I said, first I want to do a little bit of tools, and then we'll move to uh, a little bit more of the, uh, the risk return trade-off theory and, and, and modeling. So again, we talked, we developed some tools looking at over a historical sample the last time we met. So today we want to talk about thinking about risk return in a forward-looking setting. So if I'm going to make an investment. Uh, how do I want to think about you know, the expected return I'm going to make and the expected amount of risk that I'm going to face? Uh, and so what we're going to use is we're going to use this kind of expectation setting, which uh, you know, if you've done anything in your economics class, you've looked at expected values, and in your statistics class, you expected values. This is exactly the same. We're just going to be using stock returns to, to formalize this uh, for our purposes. Um, so here, again, what we're, what we're thinking about is we're going to think about the future, and we're going to divide it into all possible outcomes. Now, we're going to make this tractable, so it's going to be a limited set of outcomes, but we're all going to, so we're going to be able to in some way specify everything that's going to be able to happen in the future, right? And each of those future outcomes is going to have some likelihood or some probability. And, and so we're going to be able to bake that all together to come up with some overall expectation of what's going to happen to our investment in the future. In this setting, when we talk about expected, it's very much related to the concept of an average, right? But the reality is we only get to experience one future path, right? So, you know, we, let, you know, we make our investment, let the dice fall as they may, we let whatever the period go forward, the year, whatever it is, and we see what happens, um, and we'll have one outcome. But standing here before we know our outcome, our expectation is kind of like an average if we we're able to repeat the process many, many, many times. Right? So if we were able to experience the next year a hundred times or a thousand times, our expectation is kind of on average what would likely happen, even though we know we're only going to have one of those possible outcomes. So it does feel a lot like an average in the, in the setting that we had in the historical sample. Right? Um, so here is, again, this is nothing new here. This is just a general kind of expected value type of calculation. But if I'm thinking about my expected return or going forward, as I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide the future up into n possible future states. Right? There are n possible things that could happen in the future. Right? And each of those n uh, possible outcomes has some probability, pi, some likelihood that it will occur. Right? And then ri represents the outcome in state i in outcome i. So if I, if I end up in you know, i state of the world, this is the return of my investment. Right? So then what is my expected return? It's simply a weighted average. Right? I just take each of the possible outcomes, r i, and multiply them by the likelihood of actually getting those returns. Right? I weight them by the likelihood of actually getting them, and then I just sum them up. I have sigma side of me summing them up. Right? And when I sum them up, that gives me my expected return. Again, very kind of just the general expectation setting. Let's do an example. I'll just do some fake data here to try to keep things kind of manageable. Um, throughout today, we'll look at some different companies. Again, this is all these real names of fake data. Uh, Google, Coors, and Walmart. We talked about the end of our last lecture in Chapter 10. Uh, we often need a risk-free asset for some of our calculations, and we use the U.S. Treasury notes as our, excuse me, Treasury bills as our proxy. Um, these are short-term government borrowing, even though that we saw historically they're not completely risk-free. They're kind of the closest thing that we have, even though risk-free. The S&P 500 can be our stock market index, and we want to look at some expected returns. So in order to do that, we need some probability distribution. All right. So in this type of work, you'll always be given the probability distribution. You don't need to come up with it yourself. You just need to use the data available to you. Okay. All right. So here is one way. Uh, this is one um, set of ways the future could turn out, right? Uh, so in this setting, what is our n? What is the n in this setting? How many possible outcomes do we have? 
five, right? So here we've divided the future up into five possible outcomes. So the end, if you go back to the expected reserve calculation, the end would be five, right? So here we're very general. We're saying we're looking kind of at macroeconomically what could happen. Well, it could be in a recession. It could be a below average economy, an average economy, above average economy, or a boom economy. Right? So that's, and we're, then we're only going to allow the future to turn out those five ways. We have the likelihood of each outcome, right? Recession being there's a 10% chance we end up in a recession, 20% chance we're below average, 40% average, 20% above average, 10% boom. How do I know that I've captured everything? Well, if I add up these probabilities, they sum to 100%. There's no other, nothing else can happen that's captured everything, right? Now, in this case, we've, uh, we've we present this as kind of a symmetric. Uh, distribution, right? So on the left, the, the, the bad outcomes are equally likely to the positive outcomes. It doesn't have to be. It's just the way that we use this example, right? And then here, what we have here are our conditional returns, right? So on the right-hand side, we have our conditional returns, meaning conditional on us experiencing a recession, these are the returns of each of our assets, right? So if we end up in a recession, these are the returns that the assets will deliver, right? If we end up in a boom time, these are the assets that the return of these assets will deliver, right? So these are our conditional returns. Again, I just, we just made this up to play with it. What we can see here is, by definition, we've made the T-bell risk-free. Going back to our definition from Chapter 10, risk fee meaning there's no uncertainty. So no matter what happens in the future, the T-bill delivers a constant return. Right, it's beautiful 8%, basically. Um, and then what we see for some of these others, you see some, some you know, maybe some stories you could tell where you have Google being pro-cyclical, Right? If it's a really bad economy, um, Google's not doing very well. But if it's a good economy, it kind of takes off. We have Coors being counter-cyclical, very strongly so. Uh, this is an exaggeration, even though uh, there is truth that if the economy is not too bad, um, you know, stocks like beer stocks generally do fairly well. Uh, but if, it's, if it gets too deep of a recession, that is not necessarily true. So this is very kind of exaggerated here. And then we've got Walmart kind of being Walmart. Um, which kind of does its own thing. And you can tell some stories here, whereas, uh, you know, if it's a deep recession, Walmart's actually doing pretty, pretty well because, you know, no one's too good for Walmart if it's bad enough, right? But then if things start getting a little bit better, they trade up. Um, and if it's above average, right, you know, everyone's kind of doing better, so Walmart's doing better, but if it's really taken off, then, you know, you just don't need to go to Walmart because we need that, right? Walmart, right? So, uh, but we do see in the data, that Walmart, and I'll show you some evidence out a little bit later on, um, is less affected by general economic conditions than some other more sensitive stocks, right? So that's not, that this is not completely out of line. And then we have the general market kind of following what we were thinking, uh, pro-cyclical as well. All right, so we're going to use this data now to calculate, say we're standing here today before this unfolds, and say, well, if I'm looking at any of these stocks, thinking about investing in them or any of these assets, what is my expected return? Right, based on this probability distribution. So we're just going to walk through and kind of see how we can apply the calculation. We can start with Google. Right? I don't need to put expectations operator up there, but this should say the expected return of Google up there on the left-hand side. Right? And again, what we're going to do is for each possible outcome, we're going to take the probability of ending up in that state and multiply it by a return if we end up in that state. Right? So there's a 10% chance we end up in the recession. So we multiply it by the loss that Google experiences in the recession. And then we add that to the likelihood we end up in the below average economy times the return of the below average economy, plus the probability of ending the average economy times the return of the average, plus the probability in the above average times the return of the above average. And lastly, the probability of ending up in the boom times the return if we end up in the boom. We bake that all together, add it up, and we see that Google's expected return is 17.4%. Right? Reinforcing, all right? The fact that your expected return doesn't have to be any of your actual return, right? No matter what happens in the future, I'm not actually going to get 17.4% if I invest in Google. The only things I can get are negative 22%, negative 2%, 20%, 35%, and 50%. Those are my only actual realized outcomes that I can actually experience. But, again, if we think about this expectation as, as kind of like an average over many iterations, if I were to go you know, year over year over year over year, on average, Google would deliver 17.4% as a return. All right, so that's our expectation of, of Google's return over the next year. And we can do a similar calculation for any of the assets, just kind of following the exact same process, right? 
Any questions there about the mechanics or the intuition? Oh, not the average. Yep, it's going to score the right, but it has the flavor of an average, right? Because when you think about, you know, formally an average, you're looking at a sample, right? And that's something that's happened in the past. And so we can say what our experience was, you know, a, a typical period. Here we're thinking about what's going to happen. It's mathematical. You wouldn't want to duplicate that data because you can't determine the effect. I'm sorry, say it again? Google is so high because of the, even though it's like 10% chance of having one win. Okay. But they have such a great return on that formula. That's sure. why it's so high. Absolutely. And, and all types of averages, and this is, you know, this is, is a weighted average. Weighted. It outliers impact averages, right? So if you have a very strong outlier, then boom, you're definitely going to impact it. Absolutely. But again, if you thought about this, if you were going to think about, let's assume this probability distribution was stable, it doesn't change over time, and I was going to hold this for many, many years in a row, right, this is kind of thinking like on average I would be earning 17.4%, because you would get some 50% here and there, right? right? So, Well, we can do a similar type of, of uh, calculation on the risk side. So that's kind of the return side, right? But if I want to think about, now I want to think about my uncertainty, my risk, uh, in a forward-looking setting. We're going to come back to our tools we developed in Chapter 10, which were variance and standard deviations, our measure of the uncertainty, our measure of the risk. But we're going to put them again in this kind of expectation setting. Okay? So we're still going to use these measures of risk. We're just going to do it slightly differently. All right? The heart of the calculation, though, is identical to what we did in Chapter 10. Right? The essence of the variance and standard deviation calculations we want to know is how certain are we about getting that average return and expected return, right? So if you think back in chapter 10, we calculated our variance. What we looked at is we calculated first an uh, arithmetic average, a simple average, and then we looked at you know, how much do the sample kind of cluster around that average. If it's all right around it, we're saying, well, there's not much uncertainty, they kind of all give us the same return, low variance, right? If they're all over the place, and we don't really know where we're going to be, well, we have a very large dispersion, a lot of uncertainty. It's the exact same idea here in the forward-looking setting. We're going to first calculate our expected return, and then we're going to look at how much deviation we have in each of the individual actual outcomes from that expected outcome, right? And again, with the, the idea being, do we really know where we're going to end up or not? You know, we can calculate an expected return, but if the returns are all over the place, you can end up anywhere, right? So we really don't know that much. Versus a case where our probability distribution shows the returns are very tightly packed. So all the returns are kind of right around. I said, turns out a pretty good sense where we're going to be, not much uncertainty, right? That's what we're trying to capture here. That's what our variance calculation is doing. So again, we have the world divided up into n possible outcomes. In the example we saw again, that was five, right? And what we're going to do is for each of those n outcomes, we're going to take the difference between the actual return in each outcome, so actual return in i, minus the expected return that we calculate across all of the possible outcomes. Again, right, this is this is analogous to our deviation from the mean calculation we did in chapter 10, right? This is just our deviation from expectation. Right? So how spread out, how dispersed are the returns? And for the same reasons that we talked about in chapter 10, wanting to cancel out the positive and negatives, wanting to overweight those really big outliers that Mike was talking about to kind of punish us for having those really far uh, returns way outside the average, the expected return, we're going to square the deviation. Right? So we have the deviation of expectation, we square it. And then here's kind of the real big difference between this here and what we did in chapter 10 is we have now specified the entire way things can turn out. Before we just had a sample. So we we're kind of, you know, we had to do it, we were kind of estimating the variance. That's not what's happening here. We're actually getting the population variance because we have the entire population that can happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that square deviation and we're going to weight it by the likelihood we end up in here in state i. Okay? So we're going to weight each square deviation by the probability we end up in state i, add them together, and that is our variance. Okay? And so we can do the exact same thing. So we can use our Google returns to, uh, to work out this calculation, give an example of calculation. But let's calculate the variance of Google's uh, returns based on the probability distribution. All right? I'm, I'm going to lay this out kind of like taking the watch apart, show all the pieces. But you certainly don't need to do go to, you know, to labor all of this and go through all of these estimates and show how things are working. So again, n equals five, five possible states. Here are our 
PI, likelihood of ending up in the state. These are the actual returns. Those are our eyes, right? And here's Google's expected return, which we just calculated at 17.4%. So I haven't done anything. I'm just putting in here what we already know, okay? And the first step into go calculating the variance is what we're going to do is we're going to take the deviation from expectation. We'll take the actual return minus the expected return, right? And that would give us our deviation. Right? Actual minus expected. Actual minus expected. Right? Actual minus expected all the way down to the deviation. And then we're simply going to square each of the deviations. So you take the deviation and simply square it. You can clearly see we've knocked out any of the negatives, so we deal with the positive negative issue. And then the last step here, which is to get kind of the new step, we're going to take those squared deviations and multiply them by your probability. Right? So take the 10% chance you end up in a recession. Multiply it by the square deviation for a recession and get your square deviation in a recession. Yeah? You have that for each of the five. Simply add them all up and that gets you your variance down there. Okay. Okay. So the variance we calculate is 0 0.04014. Again, that's in squared returns. Not quite sure how to interpret that. So I simply take the square root of that number, which gets us back to the standard deviation which gets us back to just good old return. Um, and I know how to work with that, right? So in this case, we can say the standard deviation of Google's return is 20%. Okay. Questions about that? That number basically is saying that in any given year, how much is my return on Google But any given year, it might be 20 percent. Well, remember we talked about the end of way. First thing you have to do is take a stand on the distribution of the returns, right? And so, if we're willing to, as we had done in Chapter 10, to say the returns are normally distributed, right? So they form a normal distribution, right? Then we can use that standard deviation along with our expectation to be a little bit more precise about the likelihood, right? One. Right. So we could say, well, if we go one standard deviation below, so 20 percent below 17 percent. Or 20% above, so right, so it's like negative 3 to 37, right? So negative 3% to 37%, that's one standard deviation below, above, that's about 68%. About two thirds of the time, Google would fall between losing 3% and being up 37%, right? But that still leaves a third of the time out there, right? And so then we can move to two standard deviations away, which captures 95%, or three standard deviations, which captures over 99%. But again, that is based on us making the stand on in terms of being normally distributed. Which, in fact, that's not complete. It's close, but not completely accurate. Yeah. So we can we can do that in concert with some some um, decision about the uh, distribution of returns. So what we can do more intuitively is just look at this as again a measure of uncertainty, right? How much you know uncertainty is there investing in Google uh, versus some of our other assets, right? And intuitively, up till now, we've said, well, more higher the risk, higher the return. We're a little more precise about that in there, but how we actually specify risk and what risk matters. Well, if we did the same calculation for the treasury, right? Yep. Um, that would probably be lower. Not probably. What would it be? Zero. Yeah. It would be right on. It would be zero. Right? Because we by get by the way we constructed this, right? It would be zero because there's no uncertainty whatsoever. Each one equals the average. So the higher the standard deviation, the more uncertainty. Exactly. That's exactly that's what we're trying to capture. And what we saw historically is that the, although the T-bill isn't zero, it's fairly low. Right? The standard deviation returns on the, the treasury bill is, is quite low. We use that as our proxy for the treasury bill. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, um, I have yeah. a question. Sure. So, like, uh, going back to the Google standard deviation, mm -hmm. so the um, probably, um, uh, I mean, um, Google um, return will be um, so um, we first we expected seventeen percent of expected return. Yep. But deviation is twenty twenty standard deviation twenty percent yep. to seventeen minus uh, to twenty. Mm -hmm. So probably minus three percent. Yep. Uh, and also. 
So how can you call this uh, rate? Minus three between minus three to thirty seven. So we would usually just define that as one standard deviation below to one standard deviation yeah. above. Yeah. Right, that's what we would usually say about that. Oh, oh okay. So just say uh, this. Yes, well, you say one standard deviation to one standard deviation above, right? Okay. But that's what we're capturing okay. that, right? Yep. So we really use that to, again, provide something a little more concrete, being able to say something more concrete about the likelihood of the, the possible outcome. Yep. All right. All right, well, what we talked about to now is for individual assets, right? But it's generally not a good idea to put all of your wealth in a single asset. Um, actually, I'll take a little stronger stand. It's a terrible idea to put all of your wealth in a single asset. Um, it depends on you find wealth anyway. But, uh, but if you put all your investment wealth in a single asset, that's uh, highly risky. We'll show that in just a little bit. So most of us can't hold our investments in portfolios, which are collections of assets, right? And so it's important to be able to think about this risk return trade-off, not only for individual securities, individual assets, but also at the portfolio level as well. So if you're holding, you know, mix your money up in a certain way, what can we say about the expected return of your portfolio and the risk of your portfolio, right? First thing we need to do is we have some language, some way to refer to or, or describe our portfolios. And the way we typically do that is through portfolio weights, right? So we simply specify what fraction of your wealth is invested in each asset in your portfolio at kind of the beginning of whatever investment period you're looking at. Right? So WJ represents the portfolio weight for asset J. It's fairly straightforward. The numerator is simply the dollars invested in asset J divided by the total value of your portfolio. Right? So your denominators represent the total value of your portfolio, and the numerator is how much you have invested in asset J. So that will then specify the fraction of the portfolio in asset J. So it's fairly straightforward, right? So again, let's we have this simple portfolio, 10,000 bucks. We put 4,000 in Google, 6,000 in Coors, right? How does our portfolio look? Well, clearly it's a fully 60 portfolio. 40% of our money is in Google, 60% of our money is in Coors, right? And that's a different portfolio from one where we have 60% of our money in Google and 40% in Coors, obviously, because we've mixed our money up in different places, all right? So what we really want to talk about, though, is let's think about these expected returns and the variance in a setting with portfolios, okay? All right, so... First thing we'll talk about again, what's the expected return of your portfolio? Well, there's actually a couple ways, or two different ways, we can calculate the expected return of a portfolio. I'm gonna show you one way now, and a second way in a minute, we'll start talking about the variance. The first thing we can do is, let's first assume that you've already calculated the expected return of all of the individual assets, right? So you know the, you know the expected return of Google, you know the expected return of Coors, whatever else in your portfolio, you know those assets' individual expected returns. Well, if I want to know my portfolio's expected return, I simply take a weighted average, right? Where the weights represent the portfolio weights we just talked about, right? So you take whatever fraction of your money is in asset J and multiply it by the expected return of asset J, right? And you do that for all of the different M assets in your portfolio. So this thing will be in general just the M possible assets in your portfolio. You do this multiplication for each one and then you just sum up all the products. And that weighted average will give you the expected return of your portfolio. Okay. All right. So let's go back to our $10,000 portfolio with $4,000 in Google, $6,000 in Coors. Right? If I want to know the expected return of this portfolio, right? again, just give me a weighted average. We plug in what we know. We know that 40% of our money is in Google, and we know that Google, as we've seen a number of times now, is an expected return of 17.4%. Plus the 60% that's in Coors, and if you look back at the sheet where we're doing our calculations, Coors has an expected return of 1.74%. Okay. So we would say the expected return of the whole portfolio is 8%. Right. So a mixture of what we're getting from Google and what we're getting from Coors. Nothing different there, again, just kind of collecting the information that we already know. But in addition, we'd like to know, and really the reason that we do form portfolios is really on the risk side of things. Portfolios help us manage risk. And so we want to know how we can calculate variance and standard deviation um, in the context of, of portfolios, right? And so to do this, unfortunately, we cannot simply take a weighted average of 
the variances of the assets in the portfolio, right? So if I don't, so if I want to know the variance of my portfolio, first thing we're going to say, and we'll talk about this in a second, the variance of portfolio. does not equal a weighted average of the variance of the assets in my portfolio. Right? So we can't simply do that. When we did the expected return, we simply took a weighted average. It does not equal that, right? So we'll talk about in a second why it doesn't equal that. But instead, because we can do that, we have to go into this process. So we have to process go into actually calculating the variance of a portfolio. It starts with calculating your portfolio returns in each possible state. Right? So if you think back, we had our probability distribution for each asset. We knew conditional on ending up in, let's say, a recession, we knew what happened to each asset. We have to do the same thing here with our portfolio, right? So conditional on ending of the recession, what's the return of my portfolio, right? And so we have to we have to make these conditional portfolio return calculations for each of the possible outcomes. Here I'm going to show what you do instead. And the way we do it is by taking here we do take the weighted average. We say, well, if I end up in a recession, then W1 represents the weight of asset one in my portfolio. This percent of my money has this return, right? And this percent of my money has this return, right? All the way out to where my last asset has this percent of my portfolio and this return. And when I add those up, that weighted average tells me if a recession occurs, this is what's going to happen to my portfolio in that recession, right? Similarly, if it's a boom, a really great economy, I can figure out what happens to my portfolio in the same type of way, right? So the first step here is to calculate what we call the conditional portfolio return. So returns the portfolio in each of the possible outcomes. Okay. Step two is we need to compute the expected return for the portfolio, your expected portfolio return. Right. You can do that the way we just talked about in the prior slide, by taking the weighted average of the expected returns of the assets in the portfolio. Right. Or you can do our second method, which I'll show you in just a second. We'll look at our example. But once you then have the conditional portfolio return, the expected return, Calculating the variance of portfolio returns is the same exact process you do at the individual asset level. You take, the port, you take each of the n possible states. We now know for the portfolio what happens in each state. And we know the portfolio's expected return. Right? So we can do the deviation, we can square, we can weight it by the likelihood. Just as we did at the individual asset level, now doing it at the portfolio level. Alright? So once we do step one and step two, the process becomes exactly the same as what we did before. Let's, let's do an example to show how this works out. Again, we have our same $10,000 portfolio. $4,000 Google, $6,000 in Cooper. Right? We're going to put up a bunch of information that you already have seen. Five possible states. Likelihood of each state. Google's weight, Cooper's weight, Google's conditional returns, Cooper's conditional returns. Nothing new there. Right? Step one says, I need to know what happens to my portfolio in each of these possible states, right? And so that's the first thing that we do, okay? So what we say here is, all right, it's a recession. All right, this is my portfolio. I want to know what my return of my portfolio is if it's a recession. Well, what I'm going to say is, well, 40% of my money is in Google, and... Google loses 22%. 60% okay? of my money is in Coors, and Coors goes up 36%. Okay? So overall, my portfolio goes up 12.8%. Okay? So I calculate the return of the portfolio in a recession. Right, so the thing is, right, so Coors gives you more of a kick when things are bad. Coors 
is higher than Google is lower. Not only that, though, we're overweighting Coors. Right? So we've overweighted Coors. So things turn out badly for us. Not for us, if things turn out badly for the economy, it's actually pretty good for us to the way we've tilted our portfolio. Right? So this could be a way, like, again, if you, didn't, if you thought this was kind of a dynamic portfolio, this could be someone who is expecting the economy to be poorly. Right? And that would be good, that'd be advantageous for them. Right? So that would be fine. But then what you can see, too, that on the upside, as we said before, you know, Google's way up, right? Coors is down, but because we tilted towards Coors, we're not so high, right? We're, we're, we're above water, but, you know, we didn't, we did not get, you know, the 50%. We've, got, we've been drugged down, dragged down by this Coors, which we all do with it, okay? So, well, that's one thing we're going to see. The portfolio definitely stays stable, right? So we do these calculations, as I showed you, for the recession. We do these for each of the five possible outcomes. So now, we've built a return distribution, a probability distribution, for the portfolio, right? Based on the individual assets that are inside the portfolio, okay? So that was step number one. Step number two said come up with the expected return, all right? And as we just saw, you could simply just do uh, a weighted average of the expected returns of Google and Coors. We already did that. We showed it was 8%, right? But let me show you the second way you can do this. If you're, if you're working through the variance calculation, and let's assume you have not gone to the trouble to know that Google's expected return is 17.4%. We just haven't done the calculation yet, right? But you've done all of this work. Well, if you've done this work, there's a second way to come up with the expected return for the portfolio, which is analogous to what we do at the individual asset level. If we simply, if we already have these portfolio returns, just switch them by their probability, right? So say, well, there's a 12.8%, I'm kidding. In a recession, I earn 12.8%, right? And there's a 10% chance I get that. So multiply the 12.8% by the 10%. Multiply the 9.22% by the 20% and so forth. And once you have those weighted returns, add them up. And guess what? You get the same expected return. Right? So again, it, it takes you to the same place. And the only guide that I have is kind of what data do you have in front of you. If you already have 17.4% and 1.74%, which is the Coors expected return already calculated, well, let's take away the average. It's very simple, right? But if you weren't asked to do that, you don't have it yet, and you have this data already sitting there, well, here's the method number two, right? It's just more straightforward. And it gets you the same place. It doesn't matter. Step two just says, I need this number. I need the expected return of the portfolio either way, okay? okay. So I have my individual portfolio returns conditional on each state, and I have my portfolio's expected return. The last step here is do exactly what we did at the individual asset level and calculate the variance. All right? So we're going to do that again by working through these deviations and so forth, right? So we're going to first start with, here are my portfolio returns. Here's the expected return. I just copied these over from what we had. Step one is do your deviation, actual minus expected. Right? Actual minus expected, actual minus expected, and that gives you those deviations. Square your deviation. Make sure your calculator is showing at least four decimal places, or you've got lots of zeros. Right? Now I'm going to get small and start squaring it. Square your deviation. Now we're going to get real small because we're going to multiply it by probabilities. Right? So just as before, take your square deviation, multiply it by a probability. Okay? And then add them up. All right? Add them up, and you get your variance. You get back to standard deviation, you take the square root. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. On the um, final, we have to do any change? Uh, you do not, again, I don't actually care about how you work through the mechanics of it, right? If, Again, the way I, the reason I presented this so I can talk about it step by step, but when I do these calculations myself, I don't build these tables. I just work through the calculations, right? And we'll go through it. So the reason I was asking is, should I, because if I, you know, it might be easier to do it on Excel. Well, yeah, that's fine with this. Now, like you said, uh, as before, Excel is definitely going to be open. You can use Excel, you can use a calculator, you can use whatever, you know. So if you have a table and you want to build an Excel, I'm fine with that. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah. So you could build a table like this, or you can just all build them into one equation in Excel. It doesn't matter. Whatever you're comfortable with, I'm fine with. I just want to take it apart so we can look at it for the hour of you guys. Okay. Anything else in terms of the 
calculation. Now, but going back to our initial question, or my initial statement here, and we can see this fairly clearly, right? Let me get my little note here because I don't have it off the top of my head. Oh yeah, so what we had from before, right? We had, we had calculated together, and you know what? That the standard deviation of Google was, what do we say, 20% of that? And we did not calculate, but if at home you want to practice, you can go through and calculate the cooler standard deviation is 17%. Okay? So we can clearly see, if we can the squares of the cost in terms of standard deviation, we can clearly see that the standard deviation of our portfolio, which is 2.28% is not a weighted average of these two numbers because a weighted average has to fall between those two numbers, right? So clearly it's not between these two numbers, so something is going on. Right? So clearly we cannot do this. We can make our lives easier. The question is why? Why, can, why does the standard deviation of portfolios not equal the weighted average of the standard deviation of the assets in the portfolio? Because they don't have the same. They're not parallel. That's true. Why is that? Why does that matter? So why is that? Why does that negate us being able to do the weighted average? It's balanced. It's a, a, kind of a point of portfolio management. It has balanced standard of risk against the amount. Of yes. Risk. You don't have the wide risk. That's right. So again, we we form. How do we form? We form. We call, call that diversification, right? The fact, the reason we're forming this portfolio is to eliminate some of our risk. Right? And this, again, the reason I do it this way, it's very exaggerated, right? So if I come back to the page, right? It's very exaggerated, we kind of talked about that. When things are bad for Google, well, they're really good for Coors, right? And again, because the way we tilted, we actually do quite well in a recession. But the main idea here is they're offsetting each other, right? On the high end, things are great for Google, but you know, not so great for Coors, so they're getting offset again. So we're giving away some of the upside to help us on the downside. Right? And so we're, as I was saying, we're balancing things out, right? We're eliminating some of that risk. Well, that's the magic of diversification, is that it melts away some of the risk. If you were simply to take a weighted average, you would be ignoring diversification, mm -hmm. right? Because these, these little sigma i's, right? The, the Google Coors, or excuse me, the standard deviation of Google and standard Coors, they include all of the risk of holding that individual security. But by mixing them together, some of that risk disappears. Right? This is basically, you know, uh, finance likes to tout what it has done and, and a lot of the free lunches you can get. Most of that's just fake, right? But this is the real deal, right? One of the best things that finance has given society is this notion of diversification. That we don't need to hold all of this risk. We don't need to put all of our money in. If we mix things together, we can maintain our expected return, still get a nice expected return, but eliminate some of our risk as well at the same time. And I'll show you a, a study that proves that a little bit more concretely than this. This is kind of an example. But, um, but that's the key, right? So we cannot take, if we were to take a weighted average, we would be ignoring diversification, right? Actually, if you, if you, not that you don't need Okay. Well, if you were to write this actually out, what you're missing here is there's, there's, there's other terms you have to put in what we call covariance terms in here, right? And so that, those covariance terms, they cast an idea that north about. Anyway, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so, but that is not what you do. This is what we have to do here um, so, that, so that we have to do this process. And by going through this process, right, we incorporate diversification, right, into the, into the calculation. Okay. All right. So those are uh, some of the tools. Okay. You know what? We'll take a break then. So it's two o'clock. So we're going to switch gears a little bit, move from our tools into a little bit more of the intuition of what's going on. So let's take a ten-minute break. Uh, we'll